want to uh, express that before I start. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we agree with God. His uh, power enable us to to stand in the days that are ahead and in the times we're in, and may His Word and His truth um, convict us and. And may we earnestly contend for that faith that was once delivered to the saints at Jesus. Um, again, I'll continue in uh, Acts chapter 13, and positive we'll get into 14. And uh, just hope this would this would uh, continue with what we already heard this morning um, so many good things that in Titus appreciate you reading that Walter let's, uh, let's pray before we continue with this <clears throat> oh God Father of the universe and creator of the universe and to you we turn in prayer we ask for your presence and your, your guidance and with us as we we open your scriptures once more, and as we look at it, just uh, thank you so much for this ability that we have to do this, and the freedom we have to do this, and um, so that we don't take these things for granted and become lax and lukewarm and lazy and idle. I was overcome those things and to be strong. And endure in your truth and the grace that you provide. Please be merciful and forgive us our sins and trespasses. Thank you for this way that sin and trespass comes to us sometimes. And just help me as I go through these things and pray for guidance and discernment. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Yeah, I just, just thought about uh, Paul being the author of uh, uh, having written this letter that was for Titus and this was an exhortation for him and I thought how fitting it is to keep that kind of on the side or in, in mind as we go through here because we uh, okay so here is in this account in Acts chapter 13 and 14 is the very first uh, trip that, that Paul and uh, Silas and John Mark, Paul and Barnabas, John Mark made. Of course, John Mark didn't go along with them all the way, but um, they, uh, they they tried to find opportunity to teach in the synagogue, and I always have this question about exactly what they were teaching. We get these snippets and phrases that, that they were teaching about the Lord's doctrine, um, not sure how far I want to get into it before I read it. Maybe it would make sense to touch on it just a little bit. Think of think of them having preached to a governor that at the end of the of the preaching the governor was astounded at what the doctrine of, of the Lord is what it says. And so so we can kind of collect through that and through what Walter read this morning some of these things that was quite likely that was on uh, Paul and Barnabas' heart to, to, to explain to these people. So I hope that that will be a help. I uh, also have another thing here that that might be a help. It's a uh, print out of, of the map. I'm just going to pass out a few. Um, it won't quite reach around, but it might help us stay on track a little bit. Just pass them around, look at them, um, see them. I don't need them back. Um, <clears throat> so we we had gotten to uh, the end of chapter twelve. We saw some mighty work done by the hand of the Lord, how he had 
that saved Peter after James got killed. Um, it is not to say that James wasn't saved or anything. It's just saying that that I'm just saying that Peter was saved from death. And uh, just how Herod was, uh, the wickedness of Herod was judged right on the spot, and how how this brought a fear to the people, and and since the word of God spread, and there was many new believers, and. Uh, if we go on back, we will see how, I think it's safe to make a connection here, how, uh, remember how after the, the persecution, the church at Jerusalem dispersed because of the persecution. After Stephen was stoned, there was a great persecution, a wave of persecution that, that came out and uh, uh, they went as far as Antioch and Syria and they went to uh, Pamphylia and Syria and Cyrus and I don't know how much time went around but whenever the church at Jerusalem heard about that there was um, a positive response in Antioch um, the Gentiles were received into the faith of Antioch they sent Barnabas up there and he seems to be very influential. <clears throat> Barnabas took, took out Paul from Tarsus, brought him back, and two of them ministered there for a year. And it, it seemed to be a very beneficial thing that the church grew and um, the, the power of God was pressing as people repented of their sins and became, became believers. Well, now to come up to the end of chapter 11 there was a report given to to Antioch how there's, there's by, by a prophet of the church Agabus that there's a uh, there's a famine in Judea and so the church at Antioch went ahead and sent sent Barnabas and Saul back to Jerusalem with that with the aid of some kind <clears throat> food and water and money or whatever it was that they were in need of. I, I'm not really, <clears throat> I don't consider myself a great historian or someone that's able to really piece together history. Um, I don't know for sure that I, that I desire that altogether. Um, but for some reason I find it really interesting how these things kind of piece together here in Acts. Uh, I guess I say that because I see historians getting sidetracked um, with lineages, with uh, making more out of people, making more out of people than the actual message of God. <coughs> I want to be cautious about that. Um, it seems very. The speaker is right by the trees. That's why she's blocking. And I can raise my voice. Thank you, Walter. other times I desire that, that we really are focused and that I am really focused on the important points that these these great men had and not lifting them up. We can see all through Acts how they did not desire that. They desired that the Lord would be lifted up and that his name would be would be honored and worshipped. Um, seems like the apostles pattern in their preaching was Repent, believe, and be baptized. This again is, is affirmed here when when Saul, who is in this chapter now called Paul, 
speak of that uh, at Athens, not Athens in Syria, but the Athens up in uh, in uh, and, and there he, he preaches his sermon, and he thinks all the way up to John the Baptist, the attendance of John the Baptist, and the promised Messiah. Um, it was not about, for them it was not about so much that a certain man had authority, authority, but that, that authority, all authority comes from the Lord Jesus, and the, the things that he taught are authoritative. So, that brings us kind of up to chapter 13. So let's begin reading there. Now there was in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon that was called Nagar, Nagar and Lucius of Cyrene and Mammon, which had been brought up with the Herod the Patriarch and Saul. So there was five men there that uh, the church recognized as teachers or prophets. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. And this would bring me, bring me to one of those moments that, uh, that I desire to... to know more about it or to uh, to see exactly how they had this that they were that they sent them off how was this um, a few of my own opinions would be that that they were together and they they remembered the Lord the Lord's word how that we are to be a light in the world we are to be a city set on a hill and and then just maybe like things like the Great Commission were probably on their minds. Um, maybe other possibilities like knowing that the Gentiles had received the word, they're in Antioch, so they were probably hopeful that they would receive it in Cyrus or, or then up in the, the other places that they went. And I like to kind of think of it in a very positive and encouraging way, like they, they were just there and be like, what are we waiting on? There's opportunities. And in that way, they were working the Lord. They were, and fasting would have been a very practical thing. We know, we know exactly what that is. They were abstaining from food. They were, they were in a very deliberate way. They were seeking the Lord. And, and they got answers. And uh, it's an encouragement for us. Whether the church knew exactly where they're sending them or whether... Uh, Paul and Barnabas knew exactly where they're going. It doesn't say that they had a uh, great deal of a format and exactly where they're going. Um, but still, I believe it was it was very ordered that they had a specific message in mind. They were looking for open doors. They thought of the synagogue as being being a, a good place to go. We can see that. Seems like every town they went, they would, would look for opportunities. To go to the synagogue on the Sabbath or whenever there was opportunity, and sometimes they took opportunity to speak. Other times they were given opportunity to speak. And so, so they go to. Uh, okay, so I read up to verse three. Let's read verse four. We get down to twelve or so. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had also John Mark to their ministry. And when they had gone through the isle, island, unto the unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose surname was Bartesus. So on that map you'll notice, you know, the Cyrus being a pretty large island there, and we can see the arrow pointing towards the Salamis. Salamis? Um, and there they, they found a synagogue and they preached, and, they, and then they went and continued all the way through the, through the island and they preached until they came to 
Passover. There they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was bar which was with the deputy, or governor, of that country. His name was Sargis Hollum, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. Now remember um, that Barnabas was from this island. That was his home country, his home... I don't know which one of these towns were his hometowns, but it appears as though they were known men. Maybe not, maybe not Paul, but I, I would think it'd be safe to assume that Barnabas was a known man, and the governor of that that region, or maybe the, maybe he was governor governor of the whole island. I don't know. Called for Barnabas and desired to hear the word of God. Verse eight. But Elmaeus the sorcerer for so his name is by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who is called Paul, this might be the first place called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him, and said, O fool of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the righteous ways of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. And the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astounded at the doctrine of the Lord. Can it all be? Can it be hurt back there now? Well enough. Okay. Um, here we see something kind of similar to, not not as not as a direct or not as a obvious or a severe judgment that was brought upon Herod, but this wicked man, this Jewish man that was into sorcery and he was a false prophet, probably not trustworthy by this this point, maybe. Maybe he had a following, I don't know. Um, he looked for ways to, to deter the, the message of the Lord to where this governor um, wouldn't hear it. Probably knowing that if he could get them just to go to some peasant or wh whoever, it wouldn't be as an effective thing. Like knowing that if he gets this governor converted, it's going to be a far-reaching effect. And, and then, coming coming out of this thing blind, looking for someone to lead him. Like, what a severe judgment from the Lord on a man that, that was trying to pervert the Lord's way. And through that, it was actually counterproductive. Like, look at how the deputy, the governor, after he saw that, it says he believed. And it also says that he was astounded at the doctrine of the Lord. Therefore, we know that the apostles were very actively teaching the doctrine of the Lord. <clears throat> I would think it'd be safe to think that that was their ultimate goal. There might have been other other things like. Um, There's certain orders, like maybe what we heard about in Timothy this morning, they might have touched on, do this, do that, this will, this will be good for you, this won't be good for you, um, exhort so-and-so to do better in this area. Those kind of things are probably very present there as well. But ultimately, the, the doctrine of the Lord, like the, the Sermon on the Mount, the pieces and commands of what Jesus had to say when he was here on this earth, probably the parables and the stories, were all on their minds and on their hearts, and they were pointing uh, to Paul. They were they were truly preaching. A little bit of a challenge sometimes when they meet certain people. They they have so many other interests of life that it's so easy for them to draw us into. At least for me, it goes that way. And I just thought I have to be stubborn sometimes in my mind to ensure that I don't get 
it drifted away from at the end or some sometime throughout the conversation to sure to to remind them of the doctrine of the Lord. Just things like, Do you remember Jesus saying this and that? Do you remember him taking a pretty radical approach about certain things like how how the uh, past of life is narrow and difficult and so on. Um, Anyhow, it should also be a, uh, a good reminder for us how willing they were to, that uh, the apostles were very willing to go to their own homeland, and that's Barnabas here. First place they went was back right to Barnabas' uh, homeland, right in Cyprus. All right, the story continues, verse 13. Now when Paul and Barnabas loosed from Paphos, they came to Pergia in Pamphylia, and John departed from them, returned to Jerusalem. This is, this is an interesting thing that happened. I don't know um, what to make out of it. There's some certain things I thought about. But, um, there's better historians see them than what I am, and I, I don't know for sure Sunmark's life or what all other duties he had other than preaching the gospel. Um, his departure seemed to be seemed to be something that Paul and Barnabas weren't uh, completely in agreement on what it was. Probably they were in agreement that he's not he has not the faith. I'm pretty sure of that. But just to what degree that this was wrong was a little bit of a difference. Seems like later um, we can see that and. When we read on back to Acts, but what what it is for me to make out of it, I, I don't know. I mean, it's just uh, a short little phrase that he just went back to truth, and maybe it was completely justified. Uh, in the positive, I would think it probably was. He had a mother back there. There was a drought back there the year before. Maybe he had a family. If others have, if others have better inputs or ideas about what it was I'd be open to that but when they departed from Perthia they came to Antioch in Poseidon they did not come out in that part and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down and after the reading of the law and the prophets the rulers of the synagogue set, sent unto them saying ye men and brethren if ye have any word of exhortation for the people stay on <clears throat> and here Paul starts a very long recorded sermon maybe about the longest one that, that has been asked maybe not as long as what uh, Stephen's sermon was whenever he had opportunity he took opportunity to preach a long sermon <coughs> but uh, but he took this opportunity gladly this is this is probably prime time for Paul he, he probably was really excited to take this opportunity and preach to them um, and before I go into it I, I just noticed a few things that we can remember as, as we go through here like a lot of what he said in the first couple of verses was not all that unfamiliar to them but but this is just to show how easy it is for people to, to read certain things um, that have the truth in them that is is to be had, but they miss it because of some kind of like blindness. And here they, they, uh, according to verse 24, verse 25, 26, and 27, the the thing that they were missing was that they did not understand the prophet. They they did not heed to the voice of the prophet. That was read to them every Sabbath day. Let's see. Verse 16, Then Paul stood up, and beckoning with his hand, said, Men of Israel, and ye that fear God, give audience. The God of this people of Israel shows our fathers, and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt, and with a high arm brought them out of it. And about the time of forty years suffered he their manners in the wilderness. 
the Lord put up with their with their manner at that moment. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land to them by lot. And as he had given gave unto them justice about the space of four hundred and fifty years until it so Samuel the prophet, and after they chose, after they desired a king, and God gave unto them Saul the son of Shif, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of forty years. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed has God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. When John had first preached before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and as John fulfilled his course, he said, Who think you that I am? I am not he. But behold, there cometh one after me, whose shoes I of his feet I am not worthy to lose. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. And they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, Jesus, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which were read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. Saying they have fulfilled the prophets in condemning Jesus. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. And so, so it keeps going. It just, I'd say at this point it's bringing on, bringing on some things that they're not all that comfortable Maybe by that time they were thinking, well, we shouldn't have given this thing's man the right to start talking. Uh, quite possibly they thought of Paul as being this man taught by Gamaliel, and he will he will refresh our minds of some very important little points of the of the law and the prophets that we all would be so encouraged by. But then he comes by with his message, and he talks to them about um, about someone that they a man named Jesus that they, they don't listen to and the prophets that they don't understand their voices and this is probably starting to get get a little bit hard from to accept this but he, he kept going verse 29 and when they had fulfilled all that was written of him they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher but God raised him from the dead and he was seen many days of which of them which came unto him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God has, has fulfilled the same unto their children, in that he raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him from the dead, now no more to re now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. So these are all all things that it should have been understood and we have to understand them as promises of the old that saying that, that the Messiah will not suffer corruption the true one sent from God will not will not see death he will overpower death verse 36 for David after he had served his own generation by the will of God fell asleep and was laid into, unto his fathers and saw corruption, making the point that David is not the one. David is not the... David is definitely not the, the Messiah. Look, he, 
who died and the Messiah has promised to not die not see corruption but he whom God raised again saw no corruption saw no death be it known unto you therefore men and brethren that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sin and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Probably another hard statement for them to, to understand or to, to grasp. Beware therefore lest that come upon you which was spoken of in the prophets. Behold, ye despisers, and wander and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. I read across that night. I just, I just got this picture in my mind a very ritualistic Jewish disbursement of their of their of their, of their meeting in the synagogue. And, and uh, growing up, I was I could just, I think I could see lots of similarities between. Between these things, how uh, certain rituals just they just have to happen, or else it's not true. And, and so here the Jews, the Jews file out, and the, the Gentiles, quite possibly not as ritualistic, um, gave the apostles opportunity to to talk some more, and and uh, they seem to receive these things way better than the Jews. <clears throat> 43 says now the congregation was broken up many of the Jews now when the congregation was broken up many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Even though Paul was not publicly preaching anymore, there was still plenty of opportunity that he found to to speak with with the people after after the meeting. Um, and he spoke to them, persuading them to continue in the grace of God. If if it would kind of stop here, and that would be the end of it, we we could assume. That a lot of these Jews also, Jewish people also, or all the Jews were very glad to have them there and to, to continue with with having them come to the synagogue and teach and preach. But if we get into chapter 14, we see that there was there was Jews from Antioch that that chased Paul and Barnabas down and and tried to stone him. So so I would see thinking it's safe to assume that them persuading them to continue in the in the grace of God, like it says there, was probably like a little bit of a contradiction going on between the two, uh, the, uh, maybe not a contradiction, but a uh, argument. And then the two, after recollecting a little bit they, they probably thought that these men if they continue their their journey throughout Poseida here this this is going to be a bad thing look at what the Gentiles are doing they're, they're grasping a hold of this thing and we got to go stop it their mind was just so full of blood and thirst a thirst for power and things we see that in the next couple of verses and the next Sabbath day came also the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold, waxed bold and said, It was necessary that this word of God should first have been spoken to you, like to you too. But seeing you put it from you and set yourself unworthy of everlasting life, Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. 
seems to me like the Jews' biggest problem was that they were thinking that the Gentiles would be wor worthy or would be would be worth their time to go preach to them. And, um, and Paul was just making making his point here, seeing that you you all didn't re didn't receive the word of God. Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Forty-seven. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the end of the earth. I think that was. A, I just think of that being a big thing the, in the Great Commission. He commanded to go, them to go into all the world. And, and I think that would have already been a little hard. Like, these Jewish people really were set on their holy land and in their borders and the, and the things that they thought that God had so, so confirmed in their history that this is the holy land. People need to come to us. And we got the synagogue. We got the authority. All these things that seem, seem still so prevalent. Not just, there's not all these Jewish people around, but this kind of a spirit still seems very prevalent in this day and age. That, that we have something and people have to come to, to us. And just about nullifying the fact that we need to go to them. So, so, so I think that's being a, an important point of the Great Commission that we are, to, we are to go into the, the end of the, of the world. And then it's kind of confirmed here when, when Paul is saying, in verse 47, For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light unto the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And, and here we could kind of glean, glean this, this idea how that these people that were converted were so clearly converted to, to the Lord's way, not to a certain um, denomination of, of Barnabas or of Paul or of whatever. They, they were encouraged and they were strengthened and they were um, glorifying the Word of God. And the Word of God was published throughout all the region. But the few stood up to devout and honorable women and see men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came unto Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. So we see them on the map. We can see the Antioch they were at was there in the northern region, um, north of the Mediterranean Sea. After they were cast out, they kept going uh, east and they came to Iconium. And it's just they were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. This was not this was not a dreadful thing. Like they went um, leaning on each other's shoulders, was crying about their heart heart sick and stuff. They, Maybe they did, but I'm just saying they, at the end they were filled with joy. This was a very joyful thing, thing for them to see the Gentiles, to see the, the faith. And, um, they were probably thankful that the Jews had given them opportunity to see the synagogue. And, and, uh, so we continue in the chapter 14 and we can, we can see how this journey continues. And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a and so spake that a great multitude both of Jews and also of Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews threw up the Gentiles and made their minds evil effective against the brethren. Long time before about there they speaking boldly in the lower. So even though these unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and there was kind of a, uh, a pressure of persecution, they still had some kind of a, 
an opportunity to stay there for a while and speak, speak boldly the word of the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. So there in Iconium, the Lord said that signs and wonders to be done by the hands of Paul and Barnabas. But the multitude of the city was divided, and part held with the Jews, and part with the apostles. And when there was no assault made both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews, with their leaders to use them despitefully and disown them. So the Jews and some of the Gentiles ganged up against them and used them despitefully and stoned them. Took counsel how they might stone him, but somehow word came, came to them, Paul and Barnabas. And they were aware of it, and they fled to Lystra and Derby, cities of Lycania, and into the region that lay round about. And there they preached the gospel. And as we keep going, we can see how it went when they preached the gospel in Lystra. They, they had opportunity, the Lord, through their hands, um, healed, the, healed the crippled man, and, and through this, they, uh, people took a little, little bit of a different response. They, they wanted to now go and abuse the other side of this by, because that makes sense like it. They went and wanted to make them God. So beforehand, they were willing to make them to nothing. That's not worth it to live. Here, the people responded with, Oh, the great gods of the, of the universe have come to visit us. And they were getting their priests all round up to bring by their sacrifices and worship unto Paul and Barnabas. And Paul and Barnabas could not stand this. This is, this is more than they could stand. They could, couldn't hardly put up with it. They rent their clothes and got in there and tried to, tried to make this, but it wouldn't happen. Let's read. Verse 8, And there was a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked, the same her Paul's feet, who steadfastly to holding him, and perceived that he had faith to be healed. He said with a loud voice, Stand up on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. Somehow there's, there's something there that I don't understand fully. Something that Paul was able to see in this man. Maybe if I'd been there, I would have been able to see it as well. Um, maybe have some kind of blindness that I'm not able to, to see that. But he was able to see this man as having, an, as seeing a man that has faith to be healed. And he told him to stand up and he stood up and he leaped and walked. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lycania, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas, Jupiter, and Paul, Mercia. Can someone say that word? Can you say? Mercia? Because he was the chief speaker. Probably some kind of some kind of God that they already observed as being as being far away. Maybe someday we'll get to see him. And boom, here they are, and they're like, Barnabas, you're Jupiter, and Paul, you're Mar 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 Marcius. And this is more than they could take. Anyhow, the people, the priests of Jupiter which was before their city brought oxen and garlands into the gate and would have done sacrifice unto the people which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, heard of they rent their clothes and ran in among the people crying out and saying Sir, why do you do these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God 
which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein. Who in times past all nations who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness, in that he did good, and he gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. I guess, I think they're making a point that that uh, rain and sunshine and, and uh, fruit, fruitful seasons should be a witness, should be enough of a witness of God's goodness. And there, and these things scarce restrained they, the people that they had not done sacrifice unto them. It seemed like they were in, they, they were able to interfere enough that it actually didn't happen. And there came certain, thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul threw him out of the city supposing he had been dead. This is where I got the, put it together how that the, the Jews of Antioch after recollecting what, what Paul and Barnabas really were about, what they were doing, they, they thought this to be worthy enough to, to go after them. They went to Ephraim, it says the Jews, Jews were from Antioch and Iconium, which would have been the two previous cities that they just had done, got done preaching in. They got there without desire to, to put up any trial, without desire to, to work things out in a Jewish Gentile courtroom. No, they got there and they, they just up in Stone Paul. What is that? He, he never died, I don't think. They supposed he had been dead, but then there in verse 20 it says, Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with front of us to Derby. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. And he wasn't scared of getting stoned again. Paul was just, he just had an element of boldness um, that, that's pretty amazing. Um, now, as we read the rest, I find it really interesting what, like what their desire was, what their reason was to backtrack a little bit before they went back to Antioch of, of Syria, where they had started their journey. It's interesting how that they uh, they could have, if you look at that map, they are on course after having been chased out of Antioch, after having been stoned in I Iconium or whatever it was, and then being in Derby. These are all eastward turnings that they quite easily could have gone. Maybe Paul could have even found a, a friend there in Troas, where he was from, to, to lodge and have some comfort in East, and then go back to the church in Antioch. But But they didn't. I find it really interesting how they, right there at Derby, the, the arrow turns around, they turn, they turn straight back to the places they were persecuted, and this is what they did, verse 22. Um, verse 21 might be meaningful here too. Uh, it says, and when they had preached the gospel of that city, and had taught many, they returned, like they turned around and again went to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. And after they had passed through to Sida, they came to Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Atalaya. Atala Atala and then sailed to Antioch.
So if you look on, on the map, there's still from Antioch way back to, there's still from Adaliah way back to Antioch of Syria again. Um, and when they sailed to Antioch, from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles and there they abode long time with the disciples. So, so as, we, as I finish up with this, I want to make the point here. It's, it's clear for everyone to see what they did, but just the, just the, the point of how they, they didn't leave these disciples uh, without encouragement, knowing that they would need it. They are in the midst of these bloodthirsty Jews that want to do everything to cover up the resurrection of Jesus and they want to do everything to, to deter people from the doctrine of the Lord they knew they were in, uh, in straight so they turned around and they went back and they they confirmed the, the souls of the disciples and they exhorted them to continue in the faith and told them that through much tribulation you will enter the kingdom of God and, um, they ordained elders in the cities there they prayed and fasted with them, they commended them to the Lord, and then they kept traveling. When they got back to Antioch, um, this would have been, according to history, I don't really get it from, from here, but according to his historical facts, that was a two-year journey, when they get back to Antioch, they rehearse all these things to the apostles, to the church there, and uh, people were encouraged and strengthened by things that they said and um, it says they abode there for a long time probably after a, after a long hard journey and travels they were they were ready for some some rest time but as we go into chapter 15 if, if we get opportunity we will but we see they re didn't rest all that long the next the next trial was inner inner struggles where they had to deal with teachers from Jerusalem coming up to Antioch teaching some false things they had to go and set things straight and that was the lives of the apostles and I hope that me sharing this would be an encouragement for everyone to, to continue in that faith that was that was uh, once once delivered to the saints. I don't have too much to add really. I I, uh, I did just find it freshly interesting I guess how uh, how the Jews there um, should have been there in chapter 13 I guess I've forgotten which city even but where, where they Paul and Barnabas taught there in the synagogue and, and they were pretty it was the first Sabbath and everybody seemed pretty uh, at least interested in the various degrees, but the Jews and the Gentiles all were very interested. They wanted, they wanted to hear them again the next Sabbath. So, the Jews were all fine with it, you know, until, until the next Sabbath they just saw the multitude of Gentiles that were seemingly going to, you know, also take this kingdom and be interested in it and move them to envy. <clears throat> you know, they were just, they were just a notch above them, and maybe, maybe quite a few notches, <laughs> but, um, um, just, just, there's just this, uh, you know, there's this tendency among people, who, once they've, once they want to be identified as they're of this certain nation, they're of this certain culture, they're of this certain race, they're of this certain uh, elite people, um, it is hard, it's not impossible to, to, really, to really get the message of Christ and let that thing die. You know? uh, We 
get to the point where we have a spirit that's gone to bat this time. And, and what, what, okay, so there's actually a good example. Like, even as if, I think, if I remember right, it was John the Baptist's own disciples, like people he taught himself that came to him and, and were a bit concerned, like, oh, looks like this man that you baptized, he's starting to draw people to him. Uh, we're going to lose a little bit of fame and, and uh, lose a little bit of our being in the spotlight here. If he gets too many people to follow him, he's going to say too much anything from us. With that, with that spirit that we can really uh, get the message of Christ. And so let's just be on guard uh, against, the, against the wrong spirit. And, and just remember, like, when we walk through that in the, one of those chapters in Titus. And, Mercy, or maybe it said the grace of God, maybe it said the grace and mercy of God that we are saved. Had He not, had He not come for us, we could not be here. He He came for the whole world and uh, offered this salvation to the whole world. Who are we? That we think, in any way, we are some and knocks above the rest. Thank you. Thank you also, Brother Alvin. It is the kingdom of God, and uh, we should be like those Gentiles where they said that, hey, well, can you speak it to us now? We want to hear it now. We want to hear what you said to them. And uh, that would be it. I mean, that would be where we should start. I think we should start rather than have our little food text and start where we think we should talk to someone. But can you just ask Ben out the other way? A couple of sidetracks in the thing would be, uh, later on we're going to read about, uh, God willing out, we read about, okay, to Malta, I guess, the viper gets to his hand. Ah, he's, he's an evil one and he's going to die. And then because he didn't drop dead, well, he's a god. How fickle they were in Lystra, he healed the, 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 infant, the, the crippled man and they praised him as God and then later on they stoned him. And then, of course, Elemus, the source of the two miracles there that you read in 13. We don't see that today. We don't see people uh, blinding people or what they call deprecatory miracles, you know, making them like that. But they claim they have them. 
In fact, I, I had a Mormon, two uh, Mormon young men years ago, they, they said that they could blind me and kill me if they wanted to. And I pleaded with them to do that, for that to blind me. I had my friend Manuel Chavez, who's my witness, and I said, well, show us, because you're saying the Book of Mormon is true. Go ahead. At least I'll be blind, but my friend uh, Manuel will believe, and if I'll rather be blind and have hope to. But anyway, they, they just slammed the door and put the curse of Joseph Smith on me in the house. This was like 35 years ago, but anyway. But uh, anyway, the Roman Empire, maybe Atlee's brother Atlee brought that rock backdrop, was, okay, the, uh, how do you say, the, uh, the Jews got the independence from Greece with the Maccabees, and so they're free, and then they made the treaty with Rome to fight off the Greeks, but then Rome broke the treaty, so they're in subjection to Rome. Some of the historians can help me with this. And, and now they're waiting for the Messiah. And, and a few years later, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. But uh, the backdrop for that, you know, men of Israel, do you have anything to share as they were in the synagogue? It, it's, uh, it, it fits in if we understand what's going on. A small point about why he could have, on the map this year, that was from Derby, rather than just going a shot, switched over to uh, Antioch, there's a thing called the Taurus Mountains. The Taurus Mountains would <laughs> be like the Rocky Mountains, you know, I mean, that, 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 the National Geographic boundary to me was why they, they beat it. but I should be dead wrong for that. But if you look in that map, because the Taurus Mountains, that's, you know, you, you, it, you'll still be walking in the Taurus Mountains just to do that. Right? You know, that was that was a detour. But anyway, God bless you. A lot of great points and a lot to magnify.